Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here with you at you know API Days. Um, we have a jam-packed morning for you and are really excited to get started. My name is Shirley Torho, and I'm founder of Innovate Access Consulting. I do a lot of work around public health integration systems and making sure that um, public and private health sectors can communicate with each other. Like you all, I'm looking forward to our wonderful speakers today. And so I won't take too much time. Um, we will go right ahead and get started. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to our chat so that during the Q&A portion of our talk, we can ask your questions to our speakers. We are currently on the API design and API styles stage. This is stage two. And so again, stage two, and we will get started. Our first speaker is Aaron N, who is the um, who works with Amadeus. He is the director of engineering there. And so, Aaron, when you're ready, I am. Thanks, Shirley, for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Let me start then. Thanks, Shirley, again. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know these days most of the events are global. Uh, it, it, it's nice to e-meet all of you. Uh, my, my topic today obviously is obviously breaking monoliths and what, what the, the story behind that obviously is whenever you take this journey of breaking a monolith, it's always a, it's always a difficult journey. Uh, but the end or the destination is always beautiful, right? So with that in the context, let me, uh, let me share the, the topic that I'm going to speak about is how, um, how, uh, or what approaches could we take to bro break monoliths and obviously leveraging APIs. Uh, the, this, this concept is not new, but I'll probably give you a context. I'll also share a couple of, uh, the, the way I run you through this presentation is basically take you through uh, two of the journeys that I have helped in the organization uh, to go from a fairly large scale application into uh, a monolithic, uh, uh, into a microservices approach. And obviously when the destination is microservices, we have uh, put in a lot of uh, APIs which interact with each other, right? To obviously, before I go ahead, just to introduce myself, Shirley did, uh, did a quick introduction on myself. I basically take care of the platform engineering, uh, CI, CD tooling, et cetera, which very heavily leverages um, the API platform. And I want to set a context with the organization I work with, which is, which is Amadeus. Uh, it's a travel domain company. Uh, why I put this uh, here is primarily to give a context saying the the application that the organization have built, obviously there are new, but there are applications which have been built 30 years back. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a domain where things don't go as fast as what a retail or an e-commerce domain happens. So it, there is, there is a tendency to build up monolithic applications, right? So having said that context, let me take you through on what the evolution of an enterprise has been, right? To start with, obviously we, um, we see the evolution of a monolithic application. Probably if you look at early uh, software development life cycles, I mean, most of you, if you have come from um, uh, an organization which has been running for a very long time, you probably would have applications which is generating uh, revenue. And most of these revenue generating applications which were built in uh, 80s, 90s, to early 2000s are probably monoliths. And the interaction with each other would typically would have been TDYs or Edifax, right? Eventually, the the, the uh, progression to it was a monolithic application 
sort of got transferred into a SOA based API based uh, approach. Um, obviously, the TTY artifact uh, did not completely go away, uh, but there were SOAP and REST APIs that that sort of got included in the whole migration process. And obviously, it's not new, but things have moved to uh, micro macro services model, especially in the uh, advent of cloud. We also see very heavily uh, the use of microservices. Uh, and all of these interact with each other with contracts, which could be uh, either REST or any kind of APIs that that we see behind the scenes, right? So most of the API, most of the enterprises have gone through this evolution. And what do I mean, or what do we mean by a monolith, right? Monolith is pretty simple. It doesn't mean uh, it's it's a old classical application. Uh, it could be. I mean, you could build a new one which is a monolith too. Uh, but ideally. Monoliths could be application being a monolith, which basically is built sometime in the past. Uh, and what it means, it's hard to change. It's probably connected at a database level. Uh, it's not independently operating, uh, or rather, even if it is independently operating, it's such a big chunk of uh, work that all of that have to move together. Uh, it's monolithic builds, uh, which logically means uh, it's, there are hundreds of components all of them have to be built together and only then the application is ready for consumption. Similarly, when it gets onto releases, uh, let's say a version A, version B, version C of three different components need to go together and which means it, it's released together. And obviously, last but not the least and probably the most important is monolithic way of thinking. I mean, you have uh, probably a waterfallish model. You you start building applications in a large scale. It doesn't mean if you build microservices which have so small components, but if you still have monolithic thinking, the application probably still behaves of the deployment release process still behaves in a more monolithic way. So uh, the the way I would as I explain this is sort of an explanation to a, what what a monolith is, setting the context. Then I'll give you two use cases and then probably summarize in terms of what benefits we have seen with this so that you could probably go implement something similar in your organization. So obviously when you look at a monolith, uh, it's, it's typically a top-down approach where maybe a CEO uh, or a CTO basically comes and tells, okay, now we need to go uh, the um, agile manner, microservices model or a cloud native model. How would you go back and say what how do I define an application to break, right? In, in this context, a monolith, we could, we could look at three different angles, obviously a technical angle, uh, the business angle being, being more on the technical side as well, and the economic angle. Uh, on the technical angle, it's like you have a very large code base. Uh, you have a framework which you think you can probably break, and you make selections saying, okay, this is a code base which is unified, uh, everything is stored in one location, so let's break it. Or maybe you know this application is stored in 10 different repositories and you know it's sort of uh, delinked. It's only the uh, connectivity that you need to sort of break and that is something that you could do. On the business side is obviously when you look at an application, it's pretty easy. You say, okay, this is an application A, the business criticality is low, it's used heavily, but you could break it. Uh, it's not going to cause problems and then you have strategies to break it as well. Uh, and in the economic fashion, when you look at it, obviously, what's the impact? Uh, if I break this application, do I have a benefit at the end of it? Uh, does it make it easier to maintain? Is it, is it going to be easier to sustain uh, and enhance the application on the long period, right? So you define based on those. So an idealistic approach, uh, obviously, when you're looking at a monolith, is uh, breaking, I mean, the typical SOA-based approach, you uh, have the same API layer, storage layer, but you break it into a smaller chunk. I mean, you could call this macro services, but it's typically the uh, SOA based approach. Uh, in this, if you notice, the API layers are still separate. So there's a different API for one part A of the application, uh, part B or the component of the application, and different components have different APIs, and probably they don't talk to each other. And the storage is also distinguished, and it, it makes it very difficult to manage this. But obviously, the ideal approach is something which is at the bottom. Uh, where, where you have a common API layer which talks to each other, then you componentize, I mean, let's say a function-based uh, microservice, uh, which, which takes care of a particular application or a, 
uh, standalone activity and then obviously storage again being common right so in this you delink and obviously all of these talk to each other with one common api layer but having said this this is sort of setting the context but what are the two core approaches that we can take right uh, it's pretty simple i have a use case for both uh, i will i will explain both of them but obviously in a strangling approach what you are logically doing is you have a very large application you are slowly making it the relevance of this large monolith the relevance you continuously reduce over a period of time uh, take out components uh, let's say you take out the ui module then the login module then uh, maybe the database connectivity etc and then slowly start shrinking this application that's sort of the strangling approach uh, i have a very uh, detailed uh, view of what we have done and probably give you this explanation breaking is pretty simple you build a sort of a parallel uh, application uh, it need not be uh, when i say you identify the themes you identify what could be broken build a parallel application and take one day to switch over or one moment to switch over from an old application to the new application right but having in either of these approaches that you consume obviously the common governance model i mean you can't like say use 100 different different uh programming languages you can't have multiple different contracts you need to have a common governance model whenever you build this so let's let's look at the strangulation model the first use case and i'll i'll probably skim through this uh whole thing as as we speak uh take an example which we had uh we had an application which does about uh, 10 million transactions uh, a day uh this is Uh, obviously which means it is very complicated everybody is using on a day to day basis uh, the the light blue box used to be the old uh, monolith right uh, what we eventually did is to create slowly start creating components let's say a component a which does custom checks another component which does operational checks and slowly we separate them out uh, and uh, the functionality which existed within the large blue box uh which did all of these together is separated out right uh so let's not get into the details of this application but i'll take you through the whole process of how this this thing really worked out right obviously we had a monolith uh let's let's look at this in that approach the blue box that you saw uh we had a monolith which was doing some transaction and there was a database sitting behind the scenes which was catering to it so all modules every functionality was in built built uh into this component of a monolith so the first approach obviously we started identifying what could be separated out uh from a mindset standpoint we were prepared saying it's going to be a very hard journey the organizational structures could also change when we do all of this so we need to be prepared and we basically build accordingly right so the first step obviously we said identify the themes and break it out so we took out um, the ui component and we said okay now all the ui would there would be a sort of let's say a service the ui service and that part is separated out and it connects to the monolith and eventually to the database so we started small this was probably a 3 month journey uh, we decoupled all the ui all the erstwhile backend requests continue to hit the monolith and let's say some bits of ui uh, requests which are going through the ui go via the ui to the monolith right so this is where we start in the api approach uh, by identifying themes and starting building connectivity with each of the components through api second step obviously we basically uh, uh, now route all the uh, interactions which has to go through ui uh, only through the ui and to the monolith the backend was only the backend services are enabled uh, while we build this there are obviously uh, the way we could do it is let's say a new module has been built you build flags which can be switched on and off i mean feature flags is a good way of development uh, but obviously when we start this, this is the first phase of using apis it's very important to make sure that you start thinking api first you start ensuring that your apis are secure because when you are starting to expand uh, the major problem here is you are increasing the uh, security um surface right so obviously with everything was secure within the monolith now you have an api layer and a monolithic layer and you need to secure both of them stepping forward uh, obviously now all the requests that were going directly to the monolith now we call it a backend because now we have separated out the ui the ui and backend talk to each other 
uh, and all requests to the backend only gets routed through the UI, right? So this is where we start. We've sort of decoupled. We've made a backend which is operational. Uh, now we can start sort of inner sourcing model. We say, okay, we have APIs available. If you want to contribute, uh, start contributing to the APIs, and we could have other modules who have wants to contribute uh, can start working on that, right? So. Going further, now it's the phase where we are starting to break out components. So uh, one of the modules that we I could probably say was a parser module. It would parse the incoming request, it would do some activities, and then eventually pass it on to the backend. Uh, so what we eventually did is we built the module. No request from the UI is going to the parser yet. Uh, also notice the parser, anything, the data that is needed for the parser, the database has been separated out. So the backend now has one less component, which is the parser component. It still contains it managed by flags, but we have built a parallel component. So the old components exist, new components also exist. And as I, as I said, the surface area of security continues to uh, increase, and which basically means you need to build a lot more uh, secure aspects on it. Large bit, now you've sort of separated out. Uh, you have a REST API layer. Uh, which the parser is ready. The backend still is catering to all the UI requests and anything to do with the parser is also there. This is sort of a phase where you can start syncing the database of the backend and the parser database. And this is a phase where it's very easy. Uh, let's say the parser, the parser component doesn't work. There will be a huge pressure to say, can you roll it back? Can you start using the old ways of working? Uh, hard to resist, uh, but continue the journey. Uh, this is the phase where uh, you're starting to build APIs and making sure everybody can consume this new component well, right? Uh, and also for first API has been built, so you need to build the generic or the governance model on how the rest of the APIs are going to be built. Uh, this is where the switch happens uh, as as we progress. Uh, you have uh, you have a new backend which is does not have the parser component. You had the old backend which had the parser component, so you switch from the old backend to the new backend, which is the new uh, parser, you notice that the backend is still talking to the parser, not the UI talking to the parser directly, right? Uh, that's the first phase. The next phase is you build an API gateway, uh, which now is able to identify what requests I need to send to the backend, what requests I need to the send to the parser. And this is the phase where it's like, yes, we have switched over to the API ways of working. Uh, this is obviously double the infra. You have a legacy infrastructure with, with the old backend version one. You have the new infrastructure with the back version two. And you have to ma manage this for some time until the complete switchover happens. And obviously, this is the new world uh, where all the requests, the old cutoff happens. You completely move any data that's required in the database component of the backend to the parser database for the parser component. And let's say there is a component B, C, D. The same thing happens with those databases. And then you start routing the gateway, uh, the API request directly to the parser now, right? So this is where the split happens. Now you have two components, uh, and obviously it works. Now you've uh, built the first component. You could start accelerating this. This is the first phase of your API approach, right? And that's how, in some ways or form, you've broken a big monolith into a small approach in a step-by-step -step, uh, manner. And over a period of time, if I go back, over a period of time, the backend almost diminishes to a very small component. Probably it becomes one microservice, and the rest of the um, uh, there will be hundreds of other microservices which basically talk to the gateway to the UI via the REST API. So uh, this this was one the strangling approach where you shrunk the application. The second approach obviously is uh, a big bang approach. This is another application that I can think of. There was. Uh, 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 application which was doing deployments. It does about 50,000 deployments a month uh, uh, and which had to be transferred into cloud microservices model. Uh, but this could not be broken. So what we did, because it was new ways of working, we said, okay, let's rebuild it completely from scratch. So the end-to-end -end application, including all the components, was parallelly built. And there was one day for a switchover where we said, okay, now the old component is no longer used, and the whole application has been shifted to the uh, new ways of new operational model. So where are we today? I, I did give you a very uh, high level view of two approaches. I mean, you could use either of them. And underneath, obviously, it, it consumes APIs, 
uh, and all the components, API governance, security on API, and ensuring most of your uh, thought process of the culture is now API first uh, and agile first, right? So where are we today? As I said, this is not a small journey. If you're planning to do this, it's an eight to 12 month journey, maybe longer depending on the application. We obviously release much faster. So things that we were releasing once every three months, we release uh, three times, four times a day now. Uh, for the APIs have also helped us do uh, inner sourcing. So we have a million plus pull requests within the organization, so which generally means the contribution to the development is fast tracked. We can do much fast, uh, much faster deployments and uh, development on our applications. And because these are componentized, very, very small microservice, uh, the need for rollbacks almost diminishes to zero. Uh, we always move forward, we don't roll back. Uh, and on the architecture side, obviously we are loosely coupled. Uh, it helps bring in new components. We can build components uh, in the contractual model. Uh, we are fully in a DevOps model, uh, the QA, engineering, support, SRE, all built into one. And obviously this helps us in an iterative approach. And as I said, always roll forward. Uh, uh, last but not the least, we are a travel platform. If you're looking at building any applications, we have free APIs that can be consumed. Uh, feel free to consume it. Uh, you can build your own travel-based applications, integrate with various banking solutions, other products, etc. And this is something if you want to refer to, please have 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 a look into this site. So that's all I had. Uh, happy to take questions. I I know it's 20 minutes is a little too short to cover a big journey. I've tried to shrink it as much as possible. Um, Shirley, over to you if you have any questions for me or from the audience, I'll be happy to answer. Right. Thank you so much, Arun. That was really insightful. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. So the first one is, what are the biggest concerns large enterprises see in shifting to APIs? Sure. Uh, I would say uh, an enterprise typically has a particular ways of working. Uh, they know, uh, I mean, the organizational structure is in place, the way that their architecture models are in place. So shifting means a large investment, right? I mean, it's not a small scale investment. It's a very large investment they need to make uh, from a, uh, from a, uh, architectural change, technical change, and obviously an organizational change. So the larger the enterprise, the older an application that they have, and probably set of applications, and as I said, uh, probably revenue generating, uh, it's always hard to touch. And if I say, oh, this is a working, application, why do you want to break it? Uh, can we build something in parallel? It's typically an approach, uh, but obviously that's way more expensive and much more costlier to make a shift than uh, slowly transitioning into that model. Great, that's helpful. So is moving to microservices the only way that people can adapt or adopt API systems? Um, Ideally, yes, uh, I would say that that would be an ideal approach. I wouldn't say the only approach. Uh, uh, that I, I have seen applications, uh, very large applications which leverage APIs, uh, monoliths which leverage APIs, but that would be, I, could, I would call it a monolithic API itself, right? Because changing the API also makes it, uh, changing that particular API also will be very complex because it's probably traversing through the large application uh, and getting your data or uh, making a business transaction. So if you make a small change to the API, means you need to make a similar kind of a change to the uh, overall large application. So uh, the larger the uh, larger the application which the API is touching upon, uh, the more complex that API management becomes. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. We do have one more question for you. Um, so the question reads, how are you considering the splitting of the database in line with microservice splitting? Um, okay, uh, so the database, I mean, as I said, one of the bits that I mentioned, uh, anything that's sort of joined at a database where every data is uh, sort of narrowed on to one single database, uh, obviously that becomes a monolith. So uh, the, the strangling approach that I gave, uh, if you're not building an application from scratch. Obviously, when you're using the strangling approach, you need to have, you need to parallelly build the database and the database architecture along with your uh, componentization. And the 
the switch could be one time data transfer it could be a batch ba uh, batch data which which could go on a daily basis only the transaction that are relevant and narrowed on to that specific microservice is what you need to look at and build a database i mean if you build a very large database obviously that becomes a monolithic database as well so uh, i hope that answers shani thank you so much so we are at time i do want to give you a couple of seconds to just let people know how to access you how to find you because there are some other questions that have come up and so do uh, you have a preferred way you can share it in the sure. chat Uh, I, I will be available on the uh, on the conference chat. Uh, you could you could reach me. Uh, you know my name. I'm Arun. Uh, you could reach me, or if you want, uh, as I shared my link, uh, you could reach me on LinkedIn as well. You could find me as Arun hyphen N on LinkedIn, and you will find me. Thank you so much, Arun.